it's your favorite Franklin County Commissioner, right? Uh, it's your favorite commissioner here with another edition of a brotherly conversation around health, wealth, and race in Central Ohio. I'm so excited today. I have some very special guests with me today. And there's one in particular who's really, really special. And that's Kevin Boyce Jr. is joining us today, everyone. Yeah, and, and yeah, he hasn't shaved and he hasn't cut his hair since COVID-19. So we're going to get into that a little bit later and talk about that. But what he doesn't know is I got him on my show today. He thinks we're talking about all these issues. I'm going to ask him about his love life. I want to know where he's going, you know, at night. I want to know all the things that he would answer me when I ask him directly. And so if y'all have questions too, y'all can feel free to type those in on the chat box because we can learn all of his stuff. He can't say no online. He can't say no in public to me. I'm his dad. Come on, you know? So I I'm thrilled to have uh, three very special guests. And I'm gonna just ask you guys, okay, so I'm gonna let you introduce yourself, but in the essence of time, because we wanna hear from the public and wanna hear and wanna have a little bit of a discussion. So let me start off with the first question. If you had 30 seconds and you met the best looking, finest woman, she's seen everything that you always wanted in a woman and you met her and you had 30 seconds to tell her about yourself, all the good things in, and if she see if she would stay or go after that 30 seconds, what would you say about yourself to introduce yourself? So this is now how you're introducing yourself to Central Ohio, by the way. And so who knows who's watching? I'm just saying. So and, and don't give me that, you know, I got a girlfriend, stuff. I got we just this is all theoretical, gentlemen. This is all theoretical. Okay. If you had 30 seconds, how would you introduce yourself? Now, I'm gonna go with Lorenzo first because you just look like you've done it before. You know, you just look like the kind of guy that you got your 30 seconds down already. So let's start with you, Lorenzo. AC, we're going to go to you, and we'll finish up with Kevin. Hey, I'm Lorenzo Brand. I'm the agency program manager for the Columbus Urban League. I work with young boys of color between the ages of 9 and 18. And I like people. Um, I like to see my people progress. And so I would like to introduce myself to you, and hopefully you'll stay. Ooh, did you hear that? I mean, first of all, he came up with the smooth voice. He, I don't know, he was like this. And then when he started talking, he said, hey, uh, I'm, I'm Lorenz, you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, that was smooth, brother. That, that was smooth. All right, AC, let's see what you got. All right. Um, so name's AC Middleton. I am a pair planner at Rebel Financial. I work on the technical side of building financial plans for our clientele. Um, I like pink lotters and taking long walks on rain. <laughs> <laughs> Look, see, look, I ain't mad at you, man. I ain't mad at you. That's what I'm talking about. Now, now Central Ohio, you know you're getting honesty right now. So you know everything to follow is honest stuff. So you can ask any questions you want. It's honest. Be straight up. Send us your questions. I think AC just planted a seed out there and a message for everybody. But I'm just saying, you know, write us and let us know what you think. All right, Kevin. And, and by the way, would you like to be called KJ or Kevin? What do you go by? Uh, you can call me either, to be honest. Uh, I can... Okay. All right. Okay, <laughs> Kevin. What would you say? Let's see. Now, Dad, Dad has taught you right. So I know you better have your 30 seconds together. Uh, <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> um, my name is Kevin Boyce, Jr. I'm Columbus, Ohio. I'm a Brown University rising senior studying business entrepreneurship. Uh, I'm also a track athlete at Brown University. So, you know, I got that going for me. Um, I am a big proponent of building community uh, at Brown University. I'm really um, involved in building the Black community there, and hopefully you'll allow me to help build a community with you. Ooh, yeah, see, see, let's see. I knew he was going to see that. I taught my son to close, y'all, to be able to close the deal. He just did it. Nice job, KJ. Nice job. So let's dig right into it, gentlemen. You're looking good. You're looking sharp. Um, you know, 2020 has been the year out of, you know, the storybooks that will long tell a variety of stories. You know, stories. We started off with a global pandemic uh, that locked us up in our homes for months at a time, um, uh, as evidenced by my son's uh, beard and, and hair, you know, who hasn't cut, he refused to go to the barbershop this whole time. And I, I'm not mad at you because that's how we all should, should do. Um, but uh, we've been, you know, we've been locked up in our homes uh, and then there was the tragic uh, murder of George Floyd 
in uh, Minneapolis uh, that really set in motion, I think, an awakening of our country that quite frankly has been a little bit painful for everyone, but necessary. Um, and now we're in a time where, you know, it, it, we're coming up on uh, nine months of, of this environment and, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be a bottom to this. You know, it seems to be that we're going to continue into the fall. You know, the Big Ten and Pac-10 have canceled sports, so we won't get to see our beloved Buckeyes this fall. Um, and um, the question I just asked you is, how are you feeling? If there was one word to describe how you just feel right now about this year, you know, and we've heard words. I mean, it's interesting that there's been a difference between men and women, generally speaking, about positivity and negativity or just in general frustration. But I've heard words like exhausted, tired, frustrated, um, hopeful, um, excited about a new chapter. How do you feel as black men in Central Ohio? Um, KJ, let's start with you. How you how you just feeling right now about the time we're in? I mean, I think all those words pretty much sum it up. But the word I would say is that it's a very chaotic time period, you know, tumultuous because of the fact that you never really know what's going to happen tomorrow. Like, you know, you can't really go a couple of days without something and some event or something happening to you or someone around you or to our country in general, where it's like, oh, like everything's changing now. Like if you had plans and your plans are canceled, like, you know, for me personally, I'm a college student. I'm trying to figure out if I'm going to go to school this semester or not. And like those plans are changing every every couple of weeks, you know, mm -hmm. that, and that's like something that's very chaotic for me right now. If you talk about being a black man in society, you know, you never know what's going on, like what's going to happen when you walk down the street or, you know, if you're just running in your own neighborhood, I'm a track runner. And like, you know, I can never know like what sort of chaos is going to happen if I go run down the street by myself at night. So I'd say like right now, the word that I would say that kind of describes how I'm feeling and how I feel like this whole year has kind of been as chaotic. It's just been chaos. And I think that is really kind of personified by the person in the White House and like his personality and how he has handled this whole pandemic, this whole crisis has been chaotic in the White House. And I think that's kind of, in a sense, trickled down to every single American. Mm -hmm. I was saying, you know, that, that's the word we hadn't heard, chaotic. You know, I think um, there's a lot of logic to, uh, to that word. Uh, I think that's a, that's a good word. Uh, thank you for that. AC, um, how, how are you? What's the what's your word of how you're feeling for 2020 so far? Uh, restless. Um, I feel like is the way that I feel about everything. Um, you know, 2020 has brought a unique mixture of uh, circumstances that we all have been kind of faced with. Obviously, you mentioned the two with COVID and the George Floyd uh, protests and whatnot, but you also have Breonna Taylor, you know, Maude Arbery and all the other uh, sort of individuals that we're worried about um, and all these communities that are being affected by this sort of thing. And people are mobilizing, people are upset, people are angry, whether or not it be on right, center, left, whoever you is, whoever you are, somebody is upset about something. Um, and I think we're all longing to see something dramatically change and shift. And I think restless describes that. Pretty accurate. Restless is good. I mean, thank you for that because, again, that's another word that we haven't seen or heard. Uh, and it definitely, I think, I think in some cases, you don't even realize how restless you are. You know, you just, you're just dealing with the moment. And then one day, you know, I, I was, I had a day where one day I just was just exhausted. I was just, I, and I, I really, the day had just started and I just felt exhausted and tired. But I think it really, your, 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 your word of restless really captures what was really going on. I think a lot of people wake up at some point in the day and they just feel restless, you know, so that's a good word. Lorenzo, how about you? What's your, what's your word, man? How you feeling? Um, I, I, my word is disturbed. Um, there, and it, it's not just me as a person, it's sort of inside my soul. I'm disturbed um, from the things that are going on to um, the pandemic, to George Floyd, um, I'm disturbed um, because this is the America that I grew up in and seeing these things um, as they've exacerbated over the years, um, I'm disturbed. Um, sometimes I don't sleep at night because I'm concerned um, for my nephews, my nieces and, and the boys that I work with. So right now, that's just where I'm at. Hopefully I'll be hopeful soon, but right now I'm just disturbed. 
Yeah. I mean, you know what, if you're not disturbed in an environment like 2020, then something's got to be else going on with you because um, that's a good word because we all should feel some level of feeling disturbed. Uh, let me give a quick shout out to Jean Harris, former Columbus City School Superintendent who's watching us. Thanks, Jean, for joining us. Uh, Alicia, Danielle, uh, Cortez Bogart, my main man, uh, Lachelle Stroud and Carter Womack, my good friend, my good friend. Thank you so much for joining us. I feel like I got viewers now. I'm starting to get people who come on every week and tune in for this conversation. And, and more, it's not so, so much about the viewers as it, as it is the ability for us to just have a conversation and people to hear and see what's going on. So you use words like chaotic and restless and disturbed. But there's an element of this that uh, is seemingly positive. You know, I can't tell you how many of my white friends have come to me or called me and said, what can I do? How can I help this movement? How can I be a part, a better part of this conversation? Now I'm gonna just open it up to the floor so whoever wants to take questions, just kind of jump in. But, but have you had your white friends come to you and say, what can I do better? What can I do personally? And if so, what have you said? And if they haven't, what would you do? What would you do if they did ask you that? What would you say to them? Anybody jump in, whoever wants to take it. Somebody. I mean, I can go. I okay. definitely say like I have had friends like come up to me and like, you know, try or not, I guess not come up to me. You know, we're in quarantine, so I haven't seen anymore. Mm -hmm. But like I've had people message me uh, talking about George Floyd, about Breonna Taylor and ha trying to have these conversations and doing the the learning that is necessary. Um, in this in this time period, and I think that we all can do some learning, myself included. But I think that it's really powerful that some people are really taking the initiative, um, especially because of the fact that we're all in quarantine right now, and nobody can really hide away from the fact that like, these injustices are happening. Like everybody's yeah. on social media, you can't really get away from it. Like everyone's been posting about it, and the dialogue that's been able to be had in my circles has been really productive. Like I'm on a track team at a predominantly white institution in New England. Like those people up there like know about um these issues but they might not have like really understood and seen it to the degree that they have been able to now and like being able to have the dialogues and our team discussions and you know our classroom discussions at being able to be a resource but also seeing that people don't necessarily need me to be that resource i don't have to put all the like the weight on my shoulders to do that education seeing people like take the initiative to do that has been really powerful and really impactful so i think that that's been really cool but there's still a way to go. And there's definitely a lot of people who have completely ignored the moment, the movement that's been going on. And I think that's an issue as well. You know, when you have people posting on Instagram and, you know, going about their lives as if nothing's going on and like, you know, not necessarily paying attention to quarantine or, you know, wearing a mask, like just simple stuff like that. I think that kind of shows that some people get it and some people don't. And there's, it's been very enlightening for me to kind of see the stark divide between the people I associate with and being able to kind of account for that accordingly so that I know, okay, I should be spending more time with certain people and not others. Yeah, you know, and before we move on to, I think AC wants to go next, before we move on to that, KJ, just briefly talk about what happened at Brown University this year with regards to the track team and, and talk about the racial implications that were in that, you know, uh, for those who may not know, Brown University is an Ivy League institution in Providence, Rhode Island. And um, as KJ shared, he's on the track team, but something happened a few months ago. Uh, and talk about that in the racial piece, just, just briefly, if you could. And then AC, you're up next. Yeah, and I could talk forever about it, so I'll be brief. But on May 28th, Brown University decided to cut 11 different sports teams at the institution. Brown used to have the third highest, or sponsored the third highest amount of varsity sports in the nation, but they decided that right now that was just too much um, for a lot of reasons, but strangely enough, not because of budget. Um, they didn't say anything about, well, they kind of did, but they said that wasn't the primary cause. They decided to cut 11 sports teams, including the men's, and, uh, men's track and field and cross country teams. And what I thought was very interesting was that the school did it for several reasons, but for one of the main reasons was in the name of diversity and inclusion. But when you think about the men's track and field team at Brown, we did the research ourselves within 24 hours, we found stats that stated that we were the third highest percentage of um, people of color um, on a sports team at Brown. We had the second highest amount of black men. And third being behind football and basketball, I'm guessing. Football and basketball only, yeah, football and yeah. basketball only. We had the second highest um, 
like sheer number of um, people of color on the team, particularly black men. Um, we had, um, I think we had the second highest percentage of black men actually. No, actually that's the third I lied, but um, third highest percent of people of color, I think 49% of our team is people of color. Mm -hmm. And if you cut the men's track and field team, you cut 25% of black men from the athletic department. And track and field, like many other sports, has been a great avenue due to its social um, accessibility, social economic, social accessibility to um, schools like Brown that allows African American men who are talented in athletics, but also talented academically to pursue a school that they might not have been able to do or even considered in the past. And they did that in the name of diversity and inclusion while promoting the sailing team from club status to varsity status, which has no people of color on it whatsoever, a completely white sport. And so to do that in the same week, within the same couple of weeks of the deaths of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement really picking up steam in May really showed that in a lot of ways, the institution was kind of talking at the side of its mouth saying they care about diversity and inclusion, they care about their black students or black student athletes, but then their actions totally take another um, turn. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, our team worked hard to present that information to the institution and to the president, and within 12 days, she decided to reinstate our teams. But the damage is still done. And the fact that that happened like, is really kind of enlightening to a lot of our teammates to see like how they care about black students, black athletes, and how like we have been treated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th thanks for sharing that, KJ, because I really think it it captures what oftentimes looks like progress, you know, or they use that they use diversity and inclusion, um, and then it's, it's sometimes a ruse. And uh, and so thanks for sharing that story. Uh, that's where we are starting to get questions online. So in a minute, I'm going to open it up to some of the uh, viewers here. But AC, you were going to tell us uh, you were going to say something as well. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to mention, you know, um, at least my experience with a lot of my friends who happen to be white people, um, a lot of it has been like a genuine expressive concern, mm -hmm. but I've also tried to use this as a teachable moment um, in a way to kind of really uh, put to test their allyship and ask for some accountability and figure out ways that we can weaponize their privilege uh, to a degree, because uh, it's it's a lot easier when it's coming from them, when they're talking to authority figures. For some reason, their word matters, their opinion matters. The effects that it has on their community happens to matter just a little bit more uh, within society. So the fact that they're concerned is great. Uh, I have trouble with people who post things online. Uh, the pageantry is a little bit unnecessary to a degree for me because it's a, it's inauthentic. Um, and that's why I say really test their allyship. Like, okay, you can post something on your on your Instagram or your Facebook, but how are you engaging mm -hmm. with others? You know, what are you really doing? And what sort of conversations are you having with your friends, with your family, um, who may hold some of those deep-seated beliefs? And now all this stuff is out on the table. It's time to have yeah. a conversation. Yeah, yeah, I, I man, you, you hit the nail on the head. I'm telling you, um, and 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 that that I think is the tone of today. And why um, I think this, you know, the, while the tragedy of uh, George Floyd's death is certainly a tragedy, um, the silver lining in, in it is that the, the real, the, the additional tragedy would be if we didn't take advantage of the moment and push forward for change uh, in the way you just described. Lorenzo, what, what, how, what do you, what do you think? Um, for me and my friends, I think um, silence is an option. That's sort of kind of been. Um, I've had a lot of friends um, that are uh, that are white, um, and so they've been supportive. But for now, um, as far as with their family, as far as with their friends, as far as their communities, silence isn't an option anymore. Um, and I think that they they sort of some of my friends have, have actually flew under the radar um, and been very vocal with me. But when you go out and into your communities and back to your network. Silence is an option. Um, so you need to be standing with us. And so, um, and for, if I was to have a friend to speak to, that would, that would be what I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, again, I, I think you all hit the nail on the head. Let me go to some of the uh, questions that are coming in online. Uh, really excited about some of these here. Um, so uh, Jonathan Bailey asked, and I think this is an interesting question. Jonathan Bailey asked, how many of you have had to cut ties with friends that don't get it? 
that's an interesting question. I can't say that I've officially cut ties with anyone uh, because I my, the circles I tend to run with, um, we have like-minded perspectives. So I don't haven't had anyone that has sort of um, uh, challenged me otherwise. I will tell you that, you know, I will get oftentimes from these conversations, I either get someone trolling me online, you know, you know, so there you're usually folks that will get on and say, hey, I don't think, you know, black people need to do this or whatever, you know, so those aren't friends. I don't, uh, we already, our ties are already cut with those folks. Um, but uh, um, uh, I really haven't had that, but have you had to cut ties with anybody? Have you had to say, you know what, I'm okay with your friendship? Or, or, or are you like me, you run in the same circles? KJ? I mean, I'm like you, but I definitely get that from my father. Like I kind of surround myself around people that like kind of, um, similar ideologies like I think there's a difference between like this isn't like a political issue like you know we can differ I guess politically but like this is not a political issue this is a human rights issue like this is this is bigger this is a social issue so like you can't if you're gonna say it's a political issue like nah like that's you're gone yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. but <laughs> right. but I, I haven't had to do that but I have noticed that like, well, I would consider myself close friends with but you know people I follow on Instagram mm -hmm. and social media and stuff that I, I know I'm not necessarily friends with, but I know that I'm like, okay, like I see the stuff that you're posting or sometimes the lack thereof stuff that you're posting. And I'm kind of like, okay, I know where exactly where I'm going to spend my energy. It's not necessarily for me about cutting them off, like blocking and following right, like, right. Do all that. But like, I know at the end of the day, like I should be spending more of my energy because I only have a limited amount of energy for myself on people that, you know, uplift me, you know, protect me, make me feel like I'm valuable, like I'm a person. I don't need to spend my energy wasting it on people like that that clearly don't get it and like won't be able to get it. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Lorenz, Lorenz, I think you were gonna say something. You had to cut ties with somebody. Uh, I, well, um, I don't say cut ties, um, but I do um, change my movements. But I, as you said, I surround myself with people that are like-minded individuals that understand, mm -hmm. um, that are willing to um, focus and 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 stand with me. But there are some people that I have had to let go due to um, the rising tides mm -hmm. of racism in America. So just understanding that that's their, their standing, um, where they stand, um, who they support as a president. I, we can all debate presidency all of our lives, but um, that's not going to get us anywhere. But understanding our movement um, outside of that has made me let go of some people, yes. Yeah. Yeah. OK, AC? Yeah, my apologies. This light is time, so if you see it getting dark, that's all it is. <laughs> but um, so me personally, uh, I mean, I, similar to all of you guys, I kind of operate within a circle of like-minded individuals. Uh, very typically, I don't know very many people who have friends who would not be like-minded. <laughs> that's the whole point of a friend to a degree. Uh, but I will say this. Um, I personally like engaging in those sort of conversations. So I, I, I haven't ever cut anybody off. I invite the uh, tense debates uh, to a degree because at the end of the day, I really wanna know who you are. So kind of like how Kevin Jr. was saying, like this is a human rights issue. So if we can boil it down, remove the politics and whatever else from it and get this just to a person to person conversation, one of two things is gonna happen. We're gonna come to some sort of an understanding or I'm going to see you for who you actually are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, sometimes that can be a, a tough truth. You know, people who you you often think, I, I, I like what KJ said when he was talking about, um, you know, you might follow them online, so they're not necessarily your friends, but you see kind of where they're going. And so, you know what, I'm okay. I'm okay with following you. I'm okay with, you know, you in my circle. You know, I don't know about you, but in my social media world, it's yeah, it's somewhat political, so you know, I, yeah, I have a mixture of people, but I, I like, I like to know what my friends are up to. You know, if somebody got a new car today, I, yeah, and they posted, oh, I want to say, oh, nice ride you got, you know, or, or you know, I heard, I, I know some people who got a new puppy recently, and you know, they might want to, you know, bring their puppy into the picture, you know, or something to show, show people. But um, I'm talking to my son. We're gonna, we're gonna, hopefully, we'll see that. So we got another question. I got another question. Carter Womack ask what can we do to help our boys and young men um, who isolate themselves now i wonder I, i'm not sure quite what he means by that but 
but he says, what can we do to help our boys and young men who isolate themselves? Um, I think what he's saying there is um, uh, maybe we're talking about, you know what, I don't know what he's asking there. I, I'm, I, I don't want to get that question wrong. Carter, if you're watching, restate your question, man. You restate your question. You can, you can either text it to me because I know you got my number or you can you know, go ahead and type it in because I just want to make sure, unless you all, do you all understand that question? You want to take a stab at it? I AC, you want to take a stab right. at it? KJ, what'd you say? I don't know how on point it'd be, but. I was going to say, I need like some clarification. Yeah. <laughs> we have a four votes for clarification to Carter Womack. Uh, can you please restate your question, sir? We don't get it. You you went uh, highly intellectual on us there. And we all just, I guess we just didn't catch that one. Um, so, all right, let's, let's kind of keep it moving. So, undoubtedly, you all have to realize what kind of year this is. So, this is 2020. And does anybody want to take a guess of what every 10 years is the most important thing that can be going on besides the election of our lifetime? What happens every 10 years in America? Census? The census. He got it. Right. It. Bing, bing, bing. The census is going on right now. So first of all, have you completed your census form? Yes. Yes. Okay, we got three yeses, four, I'd be four yeses. That's excellent. And 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 tell me what you know. I mean, Lorenzo, you work at the Urban League and AC you work in finance and, and KJ, you're a college student and you work. Uh, but 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 tell me about what you know of the value of the census. Um, before you do, let me set it up. You know, uh, there's not a thing that you do in society where somehow the census does not impact you. Um, Everything, every data point that everyone uses is mostly derived from census data. And so we get one shot every 10 years. Now is that year. Guys, help me help the public to understand how important and valuable the census is. You know, even KJ, you as a student, there's got to be things that you deal with in leadership there that are number oriented. And, and AC, I know in finance and Lorenzo, I know at the Urban League, um, things are rooted in census. So let's start with you, Lorenzo. T tell us how important is the census, and 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 um, tell me about what it maybe does at the Urban League. How you guys use the numbers? Um, so for us, social services, um, all social services, the census is important because it tells who's in our neighborhood, um, what how what our population is, and how we can best mm -hmm. serve them. Uh, where federal funding um, needs to be going. And so we pushed, um, we this year, we did a push for all of our families that were connected to the Urban League to do the census, because if, if you're not counted, then you're not counted. <laughs> um, right. So the for us, the census is important because it helps us to help our communities, as well as the surrounding population, as well as the census is tells us um, about votes. And so um, it affects your voting rights um, and far, as far as the areas that people vote in. And so uh, the census is important. Yeah, man, you hit the nail on the head again. AC, t tell me, I mean, you're, you're in finance and, and tell us about the census and, and how, how valuable you think it is. Or if you don't think it's valuable, maybe you feel like the census ain't worth a damn. No, uh, I believe the census is extremely valuable. Um, and I work in finance now, but you know, I've been involved in nonprofits. And uh, one of the biggest things that for me, the census is important about is that it dictates representation um, in terms of our government uh, bodies. So uh, it's really important that people get counted because that's how districts get drawn up also. Um, so in terms of how you how your vote is represented, it matters. So it's not just about the funding. It's actually about what voices are being heard and which ones are being drawn, drowned out, too. Man, I'm so glad you said that about um, the districts that are drawn. You know, um, uh, let me give you an example. In Franklin County in Central Ohio, Columbus, for example. So we have our beloved Congresswoman Beatty. Uh, which that congressional seat was created after the last census, where it essentially encompasses Columbus. Columbus at the time was about 750,000 people or equivalent to one congressional district. Today, Columbus is almost, it's over 900,000 
citizens, which means it's a congressional district plus another quarter of a million people. So it means that Columbus will be split into two districts somehow. We don't know what that looks like yet because the redistricting process has to take place, but more than likely, it's gonna mean a shift in, in what this seat looks like. And what that means is it's how we are represented as a central Ohio in Congress. Um, Congresswoman Beatty has helped bring um, literally millions and hundreds of millions of dollars to Central Ohio uh, in her role because she very much represents the core interest because her district is core. And, and so that's going to change. And it's all because of the census and, and the data. So being counted is critical uh, to ensure that we know where people are, who's over there, because all of that matters and what the district looks like. KJ, what, what do you think? How important is the census to you as a college student? I mean, it's definitely very important. You know, there's a whole um, movement at Brown right now to make sure everyone's counted. I think, I'm pretty sure on campus, if you're living in dorms, like you're automatically counted, but there's a significant portion of students who live off campus and like will continue living in Providence after they graduate or like living in Providence and community in New England. So there's, there's, it's so important for college students to make sure that their voices are heard so that we can continue to like have certain districts. I know that this has nothing to do with Ohio, but in Rhode Island right now, they're being threatened with the fact they could lose a house seat. Um, and so they might just only have one. So like right now they're make, trying to make sure they can make sure everyone's counted so that they don't lose that representation. So it's just, it's, it's important on all fronts from across the country in every single district, every single corner of the country to make sure that you're counted, make sure your family's counted, you make sure your extended family's counted um, to make sure that one, your um, family, your friends, all of those people are like accounted for in the government when they're making decisions, when they're making uh, redistricting, you know, allocating funds all that stuff is very really important so i'd say from a college perspective even though i'm on i live on campus so like i've already been counted uh, i'd say it's very very important to make sure that if you haven't done it go ahead and do it it's pretty easy to it takes like five ten minutes yep yeah man you hit the, hit the nail on the head for those who haven't done it you can go to 2020census.gov that's 2020census.gov or you can call 844 844- 330-2020, and you can be counted. You can make sure that your voice is heard and that you are part of the solution and not the problem. You know, when you think about all the things that census impacts from Medicaid to education to transportation, these are all things that impact the quality of your life, your ability to work, your ability to be educated, your ability to get your kids to and from the daycare center or soccer practice or whatever it is. And so um, the census is our opportunity to speak as a community to say, here's who we are, here's what our needs are, and, and provide for a plan and a process to be able to use that information to support all of our needs long term. So got another question from online. Andre Lampkins writes, we need to identify strategies to address what will happen in our city with Columbus City Schools fall sports being canceled. What do you think of that? He says, thoughts? Thoughts on fall sports being canceled in light of a global pandemic? Who wants to go first? Okay. <laughs> All right, AC, come on. I, I thought the athletes here, the collegiate athlete would respond. I thought he would have an opinion. But AC, what, what do you what do you think about that? Fall sports for Columbus City Schools. Do you know what? Um, this might be a controversial opinion, but I'm not I'm not worried about fall sports being canceled. We are in the middle of a pandemic. I'd much rather save lives than be entertained. Um, of course, this matters. Obviously, these kids are applying for scholarships. There's a lot of personal growth and development that happens with all of these things. Nobody likes enjoys having their lives turned over. We want to see these things. We're so used to having them around. But at the end of the day, I'm not willing to put anybody's life on the line just for just for me to be able to get for a touchdown or you know score a goal. Okay. All right. Loren, Lorenzo, what do you think? Um, I'm in the boat with AC. Um, but I think we paddle in different directions. Um, okay, uh, all right. A little bit of, I, little bit of controversy. I, I, I love am, it. I love it. I am definitely okay with um with them canceling sports. Um, uh, my concern comes into then what do we do with our youth? Um, what about those scholarships that 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 that, that are awarded um, based on their performance in those sports? Um, cause that's how some of our youth get into colleges mm -hmm. that they normally would not be able to get into. So it concerns me at that point. And then especially with the, the rise in gun violence among our young people, um, 
what is there left for them to do when we don't have those activities in the evenings? Yeah, you know, I, 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 I kind of stick with you on that, you know, I mean, the county is not really, it's, you know, the, um, we don't affect schools, we don't have recreation centers and that kind of thing. Um, but I often think about um, the mental anguish too, you know, you know young minds um, need to be fed, not just with academic information, they, they are growing as people. And when you stifle that, I think there's something to be said there. And it's, it's just, we don't, I don't know that there's an alternative that, that is um, good for that development. But you know, the three of us, um, I, I, I don't say we're old guys, uh, but I, I know I'm not formerly, I'm, I'm formerly an athlete. So I'm not an athlete that's, that's steeped in this right now. KJ, you are, you are a student athlete, a collegiate division one student athlete. And so um, what's the situation at Brown? Are fall sports in play for the Ivy League? How's that going? And, and, and then how are you feeling? about that and, and, and tell us what you're thinking. Well, the Ivy League was the first um, division one sports conference in March to cancel all sports for the spring. They were the first one this summer to cancel all sports for the fall. Um, so I've had my season cut several times, including the time when they cut my, my whole team. Um, so like the mental anguish that you were just speaking upon, like it's definitely there. Like I felt it, I felt it three different times. Like I feel for these athletes, these, uh, especially for students that really need these seasons to, to get scholarships. Like I was thinking about last spring, if I hadn't had, if I was a high school student, I hadn't had my junior spring track season, I have no clue if I'd be running to division one track at Brown University right now. Like, I just don't think that'd be possible. And with track and field, like you don't really get your senior year to get recruited, you get recruited your junior year. Mm -hmm. So like, it's, it's hard and I get that, but I kind of like agree with AC here where it's like this, the, the, the it's not necessarily worth it right now and like I've kind of had to come to terms with that over the course of this whole time because when they cut sports in March when they cut our season in March I'll never forget that like you know it was so chaotic that week and you know an hour before they said the season was going on and then I see my head coach running in a practice stopping everything saying like guys about to announce in five minutes the season's canceled or we got to stop everything and like you know getting emails wow. and, and all sorts of stuff like I get that feeling especially when like for me you know, I'm sitting here thinking about my career. I'm a senior. I, there is a significant chance that my last meet happened in March of last of this past year. And I didn't do that well in that meet. So that I've been sitting with that for the last five months. And so I get that. But at the same time, like, I believe that we have a, a duty to our fellow Americans and to each other to make sure that like we keep each other safe for socially distanced, we're wearing a mask. And frankly, if we had a president that decided earlier to take this seriously, we would be having sports right now. If you look at countries across the world, that this was there well beyond where we are as a country. The fact that we are such an advanced country or we think we are, and this is still occurring, is really, you know, very like indicative of how our president has handled this crisis. Mm -hmm. And so like, there's really no one else I blame for that except for President Trump. But I think that in general right now, we, there's, we can cast all the blame we want, but we still have to act and try to end this virus. So I'd say like, as much as it sucks, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on, on this live. But Absolutely. Like, but, but you can much, say it, damn it, it sucks. Yeah, you can say whatever you want, son. But as much as it's terrible, I think, and like, I feel for athletes, because like you guys said, like, you know, scholarships, that's super important. Right? Like you said, like, what are students gonna do now that they don't, they don't necessarily in school, they don't necessarily have the outlet of athletics. Like, what do we do now? Like, and those are legitimate questions, but you know, I would hate for this virus to come and like still also be taking lives or like maybe not necessarily athletes lives because young people you tend to be healthier and be able to recover from it better, but like other people in their lives that are significant to them. So like yeah. in my opinion, I really don't necessarily think fall sports should happen right now until we get this figured out. But I am very hopeful that, you know, hopefully um, in the spring and winter, we can get this virus under control of a vaccine. We can, you know, get people, the cases down so that maybe we can move fall sports into the spring, into the winter um, yeah. and be able to do it then so that these students get the opportunity to finish out their high school careers the way they deserve and potentially move on to the colleges that they deserve to get into based on their athletic ability. Sure. Yeah. And if I can well, try on this really Oh, briefly. go ahead, AC. You want to say something else? Yeah, I was just, I was just saying, you know, I want to reiterate the fact that, I mean, we get it. Like, this is an inconvenience to everyone. But I come from a sports family. 
my younger brother is in college playing basketball down in North Carolina. He's probably going to miss this entire season. You know, it is not it is not great for our communities to not have that to gather around. It's not great for the students to not have the opportunity and all of that is well and fine. But what I've been saying this entire time is that you have to have a life to have a livelihood. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'd much rather have that and, you know, have to sit back and not be able to enjoy myself for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, however long it takes to get over this thing. Because once it's done, life can go back to normal. Just bite the bullet for a little bit and make sure we get ourselves in a better position. Personally, yeah, because yeah, you want totally to have to take the sacrifice one way or, you know, one way or another. Mm-hmm. Lorenzo, you like you had a response for that. Um, I, 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 as I said, I completely agree with you. Um, my concern is, and I, I guess my next question comes in my mind is, do you actually think that we'll ever have a normal again? Um, I don't think that, that we will, um, just honestly speaking, um, just in the place that I'm at um, from, from everything that's gone on in 2020, I don't want that normal anymore. Um, I want something better. I want something different. So, mm-hmm. and I don't think that that, that that this normal will come back around again from the previous years. Yeah, I I think you know. F- first of all, remember I asked the questions here, buddy. All right, so you you don't get to ask me the questions, okay? <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. Um, but but you're right. I think I think what you're saying though is 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 really worth a conversation in itself, and that's. Um, uh, this idea that, you know, life is changing right under our feet. You know, even when we come out of the pandemic, um, I think we will have changed the way we are um, hygienic. I think that we will change the way we work. I think you'll see a lot more work from home environments or allowances because of a a number of reasons. I think that um, we will begin to think about public health in a different way. Uh, and, you know, before, I don't think a lot of you were paying attention to who the public health director was. Today, everybody knows Dr. Amy Acton, you know, in Ohio. I mean, they said she's a household name because, um, you know, they know what she was a health director for the state. And whether you agree or disagree, now you understand the value of public health. And so um, um, I think you're right. I think things have changed uh, in our lifetime in a dramatic way. And we'll see what it looks like on the other side. And, and by the way, let me say, we haven't even really gotten to the economic implications of the COVID-19 year. You know, as, as AC will tell you, you know, the economy is always in a lag from whatever it, it happened, whatever um, catastrophic or major event happened, it tends to lag, the impact of it tends to lag behind for uh, people in government because of the way we collect taxes, there's always a lag, which drives the lag even more. And so I think that come third or fourth quarter, we're in third quarter, when we get to about fourth quarter of this year, I think you're gonna see the economy reconciling um, all of this year, and you're gonna start to see the real impact of the COVID-19 environment. Okay, Carter Womack wrote back in, and he said, here's the clarification to his question, gentlemen. He says, what can we do to connect our boys and young men because of COVID-19 who are isolated and have no males to communicate about things young men and boys share in dealing with? Man, that's a great question, Carter, because what it speaks to is the mental health um, capacity of black men in our society. And that oftentimes we're in a situation where we wanna be strong or we wanna be, we wanna keep it bottled in and we don't. And so this, what he's talking about is that we've been isolated for now going on seven, eight, nine months or whatever soon. And what does that mean? And, and what can we do to connect? Personally, I'll start. Personally, I think we can have more conversations like this what allows people to get things off their chest, allows people to, to talk about it and engage and just discuss that, you know, I'll be honest, I, let me be the first to admit, there are days where I'm feeling quite down, you know, I'm feeling quite pessimistic about where things are going and just all the things happen in society. And then there are days where I feel hopeful and energetic and, and ready to get to work and ready to do my part. And then there are days where I'm in between. And then there are days where, you know, uh, I, I text my son and say, hey, just checking on you. How are you doing? And it's, and it's more of a, it's more of a, I just need a hug or I just need a, I just need a, a to hear from you type of thing. And, and I call my mom that way. And, and you know, and so um, talk about what, as Carter's asking the question, talk about 
what you what, what are your ideas and how do you cope with the mental health stress of this year and what can others do what can other black men do to deal with some of that mental health stress any anybody can take it so um actually um i have i have a great group of friends and we we sort of have um uh, I guess you could say a prop two men's group um, where we can talk to each other open and honest. Um, and so that was, um, and it includes Charles Martin, who's a part of I Am My Brother's Keeper. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of became our model for working with our boys is make boys groups for them so that they could actually have those conversations in a safe environment with just, just men. Um, mm -hmm. And I think being able to express themselves in, in that manner has sort of helped some of them. Um, but I think that we need to be more open and honest about mental health around, around African-American men um, and letting boys know that it is okay um, to discuss this. Um, this is a real issue um, and, and sort of remove the stigma. Yeah, very good, very good. AC? Yeah, um, I totally agree with everything that you're saying. And I think the power of those groups are really essential. But I think one of the things that this is ultimately an opportunity for is for black men uh, who generally have not been very good at communicating in these instances to really figure out how to grow and be better communicators. Because um, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. If you put in a, in a position like this, you have to figure out a way to respond. And I think um, having things like open forums like this uh, my friends like to play video games online. So, you know, headsets and you're communicating that way. I know a bunch of apps are popping up where people can join on, join things and do things together. Like things are available to you. You know, it just depends on whether or not you're utilizing them properly. And I do think some things could be organized, especially within the city of Columbus and probably more so within the context of our individual communities to help reinforce some of those things that we would like to make out of it because we, we have a huge opportunity here. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I think the first thing that we need to do is figure out on an individual level, um, where are the people that I would usually call upon and start there? Because mm -hmm. if you're not aware that you have people to talk to, this will be the time where you can be more than aware of what you do and don't have. Yeah, and I want to hear more about your ideas. You know, you said you had ideas, some other ideas. I mean, you know, uh, you know, this is where the creativity of our collective thought process comes into play because we should put these ideas on paper and just see what we can do. You know, maybe it's a men's conference. Maybe it's a, you know, maybe it's a. a, a a spiritual conference. We get some um, uh, clerical, uh, clerical leadership to help us guide this. But but I I really love to hear some more about those ideas, and um, and we just vet those and just see because I think coming out of this, um, whether we do at the end of this year or not, um, we'll still there will still be some time for us to heal uh, in terms of that isolation that uh, Carter Womack identified. Um, so just really briefly, um, I personally feel like we have a lot of community resources. We're losing you on the connection a little bit, AC. AC, we're losing your connection a little bit. Um, somebody has a faith that they can hear me better. Yeah, you're kind of going in and out. Okay. Yeah, that's why I don't know what happened there. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. But uh not sure what it was. We're getting you, we're we're getting a lot of feedback yeah. on that. Okay. Uh, not sure. Yeah, let's come back to you, AC. Let's come back to you. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, KJ, now now you talk about this, you know, the isolation, whatnot. Now you did something recently that I don't know. We want to see, you know, you have a little friend that you'd like to introduce to us that this might, is it therapeutic? Would you like to introduce your friend to Facebook Live? Yeah. Is your, is your friend near where you can yeah, introduce he, us? He just woke up, but. Look at, um, oh, look at this dude. He, his name is, I don't know if you can see, but. He, oh, he, he muted, he muted the, the, the. No, you're. we can hear you. So who, who is this? His name is Cooper. Cooper. Uh, okay. 
Ah, hey, buddy. Uh, he just arrived recently. He's been very therapeutic. He just woke up, so he's a little tired. I need to take him take him out. But you know, I think dogs definitely help. Um, sure. Well, sure. nice to meet you, <laughs> Cooper. All right, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, so talk about though. So so talk though. Uh, I mean, so is that is that something that you've done? I mean, is that does that help your isolation and that help you know the time being you know to provide a home you know for a pet and to I mean is that one way and then what are some other ways you're you're dealing with the isolation? Yeah, um, I definitely think like pets are very helpful, but like not everyone can always have access to a pet. But like right now, especially when you know everything in the world is kind of like collapsing like i think mm -hmm. go to your local animal shelter like try to adopt a pet a dog a cat i think that's something that's like really helpful both to them and to you um but going back to um the question and i might be going completely off of a random tangent but like i said at the beginning like i love building communities i'm a community builder at brown like that's something i like to do and what i've been doing is helping with african-american men or black men in general at brown like kind of connect with each other um, the younger guys connecting to older people, you know, current students connecting with alumni, like kind of building those connections. I've been doing series of meetings and calls with people that I'm close to and organizations I'm a part of to like kind of facilitate that, to help have these conversations. I think for black men in particular, and we talk about this at school all the time, like there's a lot of stigmas in the black community, particularly for black men with regards to masculinity, with regards to being vulnerable and talking about these issues. And I think like, you know, being able to talk with older African-American men about these topics is really helpful, especially when like in a lot of our communities that was frowned upon for most of most of our lives. So like being able to open up and have these tough discussions, but honest and candid discussions about that with people is really, really helpful, whether that's one on one, a group setting, a conference, um, whatever that may be, because like at the end of the day, not talking about them doesn't make them go away like they're still here. And so like, whether we want to address it or not, like they're an issue that affects so many in our community, including myself. So like being able to sit and talk about that with people and, you know, do it openly and really like kind of explore that together as a kind of a collective is really helpful and really powerful. And so I'd say like being able to do that with people that are older and also like have, that also helps, you know, older adults as well, be able to connect with young people, see kind of like what our generation is going through with, mm -hmm. with everything. Thing and how we're handling this this whole this whole movement so i'd say you know if we can find ways to do that virtually that's great i know that access to internet you know video call isn't necessarily like everywhere so that's obviously an issue but like if we could find a way to make that um more accessible to, to people across the city like i think that would help people not feel as isolated because for me like i've had these weekly calls with people and that's been really helpful and that's been the conversations that we've kind of engendered in those groups has been really helpful and like being able to get me through like, you know, times where I don't necessarily talk to a lot of people or like, you know, when there's a lot of things going on in the world, when you're sitting at home by yourself, but it seems like every entity and body around you doesn't care about black life. Like, you know, it's nice to be able to have that, like re that group or like that person or that those people that can help you reorient yourself or recenter yourself around the idea that like your life matters and like your mental health matters. And like you, at the end of the day, matter. Yeah, man. I mean, I, you, you all see where I just I'm I'm gawking over here over my son, just watching him. He's like I always say he's like the 2.0 version. You know, he's like the the new and improved. You know, Kevin Boyce and um, and my other son. By the way, let me just announce my other son, Christopher, who's a senior in high school this year. Um, is actually so we're gonna spin this show off into a podcast. We're gonna keep the same time. Uh, on Wednesdays uh, at three o'clock and we're going to start a podcast starting next week and my son Christopher is working on some graphics and things he's like dad I can do this and so I'm excited to see what he does but he's a, a technology guru technology guru and uh, so but this is my other son uh, the oldest one and so and, and it's good to meet your puppy the other thing I the other thing I would uh, just add to is that you said something that's really important and that's not being afraid to address your vulnerabilities. And, you know, I think as black men, we often work, we often try to live in this macho space where um, we have to look strong and we have to not look like things affect us. And the reality is things affect us all the time. You know, I've got friends who they'll, they'll say, oh, I don't care about this. I ain't, that's, you know, soft or I'm not, you know, and the reality is if you didn't care about it, you probably wouldn't be talking about it right now. And so you do care about it and it's okay to talk about it. It's okay to feel, 
frustrated or mad or sad or angry or whatever. And so uh, I think we need more of that. And, and, and I got to say, I'm growing as a person in this kind in this section of uh, mental space, too. So uh, I hope that you all are. Um, so we got five minutes, guys. And I want to basically give you a chance to kind of talk about, say something that you want to talk about. You know, what if you had a minute to just kind of say something to Central Ohio who's watching, you know, we've, we've since we started the show, we average on average of anywhere from about 2,000 to 5,000 viewers um, per show that go on, they watch it on YouTube. Um, and so you got a chance, you got an audience to talk to right now. Um, and and, and I'll, 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 I'll add this question in, give you a minute to just sort of give closing remarks on you know, what you'd say to folks watching um, and listening here today. Uh, but Alicia Daniel wrote in um, a conference, a men's conference whose scope uh, has a holistic approach would be amazing for our community. Thoughts? Uh, Alicia, that's exactly what we want to do. That's part of what these forums are. So we'll see where that goes and where it evolves. Uh, but I think it's a great opportunity. And, and all the conversations I've had with my friends and, and then we've had on the show have been such um, uplifting and good conversations. But but maybe work that into your closing marks. Do you think that's a good idea? And you, know, you got a minute to say something to the folks of Central Ohio. Let's start with you, AC. Yeah, so um, and really briefly, what I was going to say is that uh, make make use of the organizations that you do have. If you have a faith based organization, uh, utilize the church. Um, you know, those people, I mean, they're all about congregation, right? So there are opportunities there to collaborate and interact with people. Um, if you have any organizations that you're involved with, like I help run a nonprofit uh, called the Hip Hop Congress here in Columbus, and we've hosted live stream free concerts for people. So, I mean, that's a great way for people to congregate. I own an app called Band is in Town. And every time I hear about some other artist who's doing a free live stream, there are more than enough ways to entertain yourself. There are more than enough ways to interact with people in a productive way. Uh, so make use of them. Uh, pick up the phone. Things are, <laughs> things are slow down. Mm -hmm. Give your grandmother a call. Give your mother a call. You know, today was my grandmother's birthday. So I gave her a call in the middle of the office. <laughs> you know, um, but all things considered, uh, what I would really want to drive home with people is going back to that idea of being restless. Um, we can't hold up. We can't stop pushing for change. We are at like the precipice of something really important right now. And I feel like one of the things that they become really reliant on is complacency or exhaustion. You know, it's the hot topic of the day. You know, people are going to be upset for a little bit. The energy is going to die down. And there's no follow through at that point. Um, I helped organize for Occupy Wall Street when it was in Athens at Ohio University. And I saw that happen. You know, for all these movements that we have and all these opportunities that we have to mobilize, we have to have some sort of follow through and be willing to see this through to the end. Um, okay. If you if you really want to see the change, you have to continue to ask for accountability. That's right. You have to That's understand right. that level of exhaustion is going to kick in. It's like an athlete. You know, you get to that point where you're ready to like break down, but there's still, you know, there's still room left to go. You know, uh, Kevin. Well, thank you, you AC. Yeah, right? absolutely. Thanks for for being on today, Lorenz. What what you got for us? What you got? You you on mute? Really, AC said it best. Um, we got to keep going. Um, we got to a place where we were stagnant and I see the movement moving again. And so I'm excited about it. Um, I want everyone to remember to be your authentic self. I think that that's another thing that we need to push with our African-American young men is that we're trying to get them to, to understand that this is the world that we live in. We don't want you to really, we do want you to adapt in some ways, but please be your authentic self. It's being you is enough. And I think that that's the message that we need to be sending. Um, outstanding. That's outstanding, man. All right, KJ, bring us home. So what's your what's your closing comments? Uh, my closing comments is really a shout out. And that's a shout out to my whole generation who's like been really suffering through this and has stuck through it and has been through a lot in our short time on this planet. Like I'm 21 years old and we've seen quite a bit. Like who would have thought we would have lived through a whole global pandemic at the same time as um, like our newest civil rights movement. But I have to say I'm proud of us. I really am proud of like what we are doing to affect change in our communities, both at small, micro and macro levels. And, you know, being able to do that through social media, in person, you know, stepping out and, you know, socially distancing.
testing and all that stuff. I think that we're doing a really good job. And so I think we should continue to do that, continue to fight for what we believe in and keep doing that, whether after this year, um, you know, for the next five years, 10 years, mm -hmm. like whatever. I think using social media has been great. I think doing it in person has been great. And I think that I'm really just proud to say like, you know, at the end of the day, we are affecting some sort of change in our communities across our country. And that we're tired, <laughs> quite frankly, yeah. we're tired. And I think that I'm just really, I just can't stress enough how proud I am to, to be a part of a generation that's willing to stand up and do that. Well, gentlemen, I, I want to say our time has come, uh, but certainly uh, I'm grateful for you taking time out of your calendars and sched busy schedules to be with us and host a conversation, a brotherly conversation on wealth, health, and race in Central Ohio. You all have been amazing. You're all amazing young men. I look forward to all of the contributions that you make in Central Ohio. Um, to AC and Lorenzo, uh, thank you in uh, everything you do and in, in, uh, in with the Urban League and in finance. Those are critical areas of services. And, and KJ, thank you for what you represent for the next generation. Thank you for uh, being ready to take on the mantle and to, to, to take the mantle and, and be a leader. And, um, and so we appreciate you. We thank you to Central Ohio. This is our last show on this format, but we are going full all out podcast starting next week on Wednesday, three o'clock. I hope you're going to join me. We're going to have some fun. We're going to talk about people, talk about you. I didn't get to ask my son the question I want to ask him too, like, so how's your love life going, you know, but stay tuned because we'll have a podcast just on that discussion alone. And I that'll be the fun. Fifth. Um, I have no comment on that on that situation. <laughs> no comment. He learned well. He learned well. He learned well. Uh, with that being said, uh, it, our time has come to conclusion. Again, remember, fill out your census form if you don't know where to do it. Go to 2020census.gov or call one eight call one eight four four three three zero twenty twenty. That's eight four four three three zero twenty twenty, and fill out your census. Do your part to make America the best that we can. Be. And so uh, with that, I'm going to sign off. Thank you so much for joining me, us, Central Ohio. Have a great day, men. We'll see you.